Okay, uh, good afternoon, friends. Today is the 28th lecture of Vishwabharati lecture series. The series which we started in January 2019 is going on steadily. And we are happy to welcome today in that series, uh, the Honorable Ambassador Deepa Gopalan Vadhva. Now, Madam Vadhva, doesn't require any introduction because she is famous in her own right. She joined Indian Foreign Service in, 19, in 1979 and completed her tenure in 2015. During this you know, long journey, Madam Vadhva served India in many foreign missions. And you know, we, we have got a special kind of privilege today because Madam Wadhwa was in also in Japan for a while. And in, 19, in 1916, as you know, Tagore visited Japan because Jap Tagore always wanted to look to the Asian countries to imbibe the culture simply because the cultural heritage of these Southeast Asian countries or East Asian countries have familiarity with what we have in India. So to in Tagore's mind, the, all, all the Southeast Asian countries and East Asian countries have had a very emotional attachment. So that way, I think we are privileged to have Madam Wadhwa because Wadhwa was there in Japan and he, she was the one who popularized Tagore to a significant extent. And I must thank uh, our uh, colleague, Madam Gita Kini, because of her initiative, we got uh, Madam Wadhwa, and uh, as, as you, uh, I know, and uh, everybody is keenly awaiting to hear Madam Wadhwa on this particular important topic, the relationship between Japan and India. And I'm sure um, given her kind of experience, we'll be really enlightened, we'll be really enriched um, with her presentation mm -hmm. and our perspective will be enriched to a significant extent. And mm -hmm. Madam Wadhwa, I think I wish I could invite you physically to the campus, but because of the pandemic, we'll have to be content with just you know listening to you online. But th this is not to be recorded, and unless and until you visit us in near future, uh, we'll not record your visit or record your interaction with us today. So, Madam, with a kind of you know honest request to you, please visit us uh, whenever the pandemic restrictions are over. Uh, with these uh, words, Madam, again, I thank you. And I thank you, the participants, my, uh, uh, you know, all my um, colleagues in, in the campus, and also those who are listening to Madam Wadhwa, I welcome all of them. Uh, and I'm sure we'll um, be um, happy to have Madam Wadhwa, given her experience, she'll be able to give us a certain very critical inputs to understand this important theme uh, involving India and Japan. With these uh, words, uh, I request Nimai to take over the floor and request Madam Wadhwa to start uh, her address. Namaskar. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Bidya Chakravarti, Thank you so much for your very warm words and uh, your words of also your invitation to come to Vishwabharti. I must say that I had the privilege of coming there almost five years ago. And, uh, but I'm greedy for more. Hello. No. Hello. 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 Can you can you hear me? I'm sorry, there was a problem. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right. I'm I'm just sorry. Yeah. I hope that the you know I hope this stays. So I was just saying that I had the privilege of coming five years ago, and I I really uh, would love to come back again because it wasn't a long enough visit, and that was as part of the Ministry of External Affairs outreach um, uh, on public diplomacy that I was there, and I had the wonderful uh, also the opportunity to meet. Um, uh, Professor Kinney. So um, I'd like to again uh, thank you for the invitation, um, Honorable Vice Chancellor, and um, I'd address the members of the faculty, other participants who are here. 
um, you know, uh, when I came to Vishwa Bharati the last time, I had just completed uh, about three over three years of my stay as ambassador in um, Japan, and it was very fresh. And uh, one of my last, uh, you know, experiences before I left was I went to Yokohama, and I went to the place where uh, Guru Dev had gone, and I sat in the you know, in the rooms that he sat and which inspired him. And it was just a wonderful experience because you'd be surprised to know how much he is still remembered in Japan. There are people through association who still remember him a lot. So um, I am today actually speaking about why is the India-Japan relationship special? And, um, you know, it, it is special because it's also called a special strategic and global partnership. And in some ways, it was the reason why I, I chose the subject. But there's a lot in it, you know, there's a lot of elements in it which sets it apart from other, every other relationship that India has with any other country. This relationship has evolved actually very dramatically in the first two decades of the century uh, to become one of India's foremost foreign policy successes. And it's also a very significant relationship because it the 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 uh, it has changed and shaped the narrative of what is called the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this Indo-Pacific region, as you know, has become the hub of global economic growth, and it's also a region of strategic contest due to the economic rise and the military assertiveness of China. In fact, I'm sure some of you know, but I'll just repeat it: uh, is that where did this concept of the Indo-Pacific come? It was actually given currency by the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who visited India in 2007. And as he was addressing a joint session of our parliament, he talked about the confluence of the two seas. And he talked about this in context of the Indian and the Pacific Ocean as a geographic and a geoeconomic continuum. And he named it the Indo Pacific. In doing so, he bound India in many ways with the strategic uh, objectives of Japan. He bound this together, and I will explain to you why. It is important to remember that before this, this region was not called the Indo-Pacific. It was called the Asia-Pacific. And, um, you know, it stopped short of India. It stopped at, the, at, at Myanmar, the borders of Myanmar, of ASEAN. So in 1989, when the APEC formation was, the, the economic grouping, grouping came about, which is called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, it had on, on the uh, eastern uh, ends of the Pacific, it had Canada, it had US, and it had uh, Mexico. And on the, on the Western rim, it had uh, China, Russia, and the ASEAN. And I used to be, uh, you know, in, in uh, China in those days, posted in China in those days, and we were very keen to join APEC, but we were not permitted to join because we were not part of the Asia Pacific. So Prime Minister Abe, in coining this word, Indo-Pacific, actually embraced India and made us part of this great turn, in fact, this great development that is happening in the, in, in the Asian uh, continent. So this is something that, you know, makes the relationship really uh, special because, you know, this was the Japanese who made sure that we were also part of uh, what was happening at the activity and there was acknowledgement of India's contribution in the larger Asian context. Um, now what has happened is that, you know, the, this Indo-Pacific Indo construct, which was first mooted in 2007, over the years it has gained much more currency and much more adherence. So today, besides the US, Australia, New Zealand, ASEAN, they all have an Indo-Pacific outlook. And the European powers, these are the latest to come on board, such as France, Germany, and the UK, have also formulated their Indo-Pacific strategies. And what is important is that India has a very keen position in this. It is no wonder, therefore, that China still doesn't want to accept the Indo-Pacific and prefers the Asia-Pacific, because I don't think they want to share primacy in Asia with any other emerging power which would challenge them. And so to return, let me return to the India-Japan India special relationship. In a world of fast-moving realignments, as we've been seeing in the last few years, it stands out for its very comprehensive collaboration in terms of areas of cooperation. And it is this increasing depth and stability in the relationship in the last two decades. And uh, therefore, we have uh, former Prime Minister uh, Abhi, who just stepped down, and Prime Minister Modi, who have both said, described it as a re relationship with the most potential 
to define not only the future of the Indo-Pacific region, but of the world. And in the process, enhance mutual prosperity and security. Now, this is really very, very hyperbolic, in fact, in terms of language one would think that this does reflect a reality. Among the many aspects which make this partnership special is the fact that both countries are committed to the institution of what we call annual prime ministerial level summits. Now, this was uh, instituted in 2006 and has continued without any disruption, excepting for the last COVID pandemic, which we have, uh, which uh, we've been all facing. And this meant that every year our prime ministers have met. Now, this institution of annual prime ministerial visits in diplomacy is extremely rare. So Japan has it with no other country other than India. And India has it only with Russia and Japan. So you can see how important this relationship is for us. The prime ministerial level summits have given direction and they review process, pro, uh, progress on an annual basis when they meet in areas of agreed cooperation. And then they deliberate you know, new areas of cooperation. The implementation of what they say is affected by a very multi-layered, multi-dimensional architecture of exchanges, which form the grid on which the entire pyramid of the relationship uh, vests. They extend from what is called a two plus two dialogue and people who form, follow international relations will understand the two plus two dialogue is when the foreign and defense ministers of two countries meet with their counterparts. And this is an institution we first had with Japan and we have now extended it to the US and Australia. Under this, we have ministers of almost every department that you can think of and officials who meet in various capacities over the year. It is a plethora of meetings. In fact, uh, when I was in Japan, I think it was very difficult to cope with the number of meetings that we had on both sides. And at a very, very senior ministerial level, where at each place they were looking at implementation, what can we add to it? How can we widen the, the interaction? And these covered areas, very wide areas. And I'll just give a sense of this. Uh, so there was commerce, finance, Niti Aayog, environment, education, health, railways, infrastructure, urban development, energy, water resources, uh, human resource development, science and technology, space, cybersecurity, IT, telecom. And I can tell you this is not an exhaustive list, but this is the, this is the kind of cooperation that we have with Japan, which makes this relationship extremely special. Besides the bilateral engagement, there is growing strategic convergence also between the two countries on regional and global issues. So this is besides bilateral, uh, which is also impelled by a desire of both countries to shoulder greater regional and global responsibilities. Because both of us, if we look at a multipolar world and we see ourselves as two poles who are willing and are capable of, of, of shouldering more responsibilities, both in the region and globally. Examples of this can be seen in the close coordination of policies in the Indo-Pacific and participation in the quadrilateral security dialogue, which you must be reading a lot about the court, um, with which, which Australia and the US are also members. At the level of global institutions such as the UN, Japan and India, along with Brazil and Germany, uh, work under the rubric of something called the G4, where we're looking for a reform of the UN and very importantly, a restructuring of the UN Security Council to reflect the contemporary, contemporary realities. Because as you know, these institutions were, were a holdover of the period right after the Second World War. This is introduction. I would like to elaborate a little on the drivers of the special relationship, which provides the strong underpinning to ensure its viability, sustainability, and also that there is a constant advancement. It's a dynamic process and, and that there's a strengthening and there's a constant advancement. I would like to start a little bit with history because the Honorable Vice Chancellor also spoke of Gurudev and I thought I should talk a little bit about the historical links. And here Bengal has a very important role to play. Um, I would, uh, you know, despite despite the geographies that we were kind of remote from each other, uh, there are many strands of common heritage which bind our two peoples. Um, though this is lesser known, I think very few people know these connections between us. What is evident is that there's a general feeling of goodwill in Japan for India. It's a very positive perception that people in Japan have 
of India, which they call Tenjiku, as as you would as as uh, Professor Kini would know, the country from where Buddhism originated, and the Hindu gods that you find there, you know, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Ganesha, uh, Shiva as Mahakala, and they just they are there alongside Shinto and Buddhist uh, deities. Uh, uh, you know, they're part of the, the legends, their, their religious beliefs. It's it's quite amazing, and it's a it was a great discovery to me to find how much exposure there was to India. Uh, through the root, uh, this came through the root of religious practices and beliefs, and I think what happened with this as a result of this is that we came to share a common value system. Again, little acknowledged, and this has been very important in being able to understand each other. The earliest traces of the Indian connection in Japan, which came uh, filtered through uh, China and Korea, were not direct, but uh, can be traced with some certainty to the 8th century, where there was an uh, Indian monk called Bodhisena. And Bodhisena landed up in, in um, Nara. He was invited by the emperor called Shomu, and he is known to have uh, uh, performed the consecration ceremony of something called, it's called the Vairochana Buddha in, um, in the Kalaiji Temple in Nara, which is the largest bronze statue of its sort in the world. So in the, in uh, you know, it was, we have a record somewhere of Bodhisena being the first Indian that we knew of. Uh, but by the time Buddhism was already established in, at, uh, already established in Japan. In the 9th century, you can see more direct cultural influence through another very famous um, uh, Japanese called Kubai, called Kobodaishi. And I hope one day somebody in Shubharti does a PhD on Kobodaishi. And his contribution to Japan and India relations is an absolutely an amazing figure. In fact, uh, you know, he, even the, the script, the Hiragana script, the phonetic script of Japanese borrows from Sanskrit. Uh, from the 16th century onwards, of course, we have the same mercantilist uh, powers, the Portuguese and the Dutch, who uh, have records from them because, you know, they they were, um, they were traveled, they were based in India and they traveled and they traded also with Japan. Um, there are many other examples to show the commonality of our cultural moorings, including the performing arts, uh, uh, theater, music. Uh, but what perhaps enables an understanding at a deeper, I feel, and even though a sub somewhat imperceptible level, is really our shared metaphysical beliefs in things such as karma, rebirth, coexistence. I often felt when I was in Japan that the Japanese with their unwavering attachment to duty, I thought they were much better Hindus than us. They really practiced the, the, the words of the Gita, you know, of the precepts of the Gita, of devotion to duty. And but this must be all part of the same heritage that we do share. Empirical evidence of historical contacts between the two countries can be found um, more easily actually in recent times. And that is after the Meiji Reformation. And there was the establishment of direct shipping links between our two countries. And it also it took Indian traders there and they set up uh, in Kobe, Osaka, and in Yokohama. But very interestingly, it also took luminaries like Sir Jamchechi Tata and Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda spent about three months in Japan. And what he wrote about Japan is really, uh, you know, it, it is worth reading. Uh, you know, he, he, he had this belief that every Indian should have an opportunity to visit Japan. He held it in the highest, highest regard. This was the beginning of direct con uh, contacts between uh, the two countries. And this is what took uh, Gurudev Rabindranath to go uh, to Japan five times he went and laid the foundation of Japan-related studies at Shantiniketan and then which developed into the Nippon Bhavna at uh, Bhutabharti. So, you know, there is a very, very close connect between um, uh, Japan and the intelligentsia, actually, at the, uh, of, of India of a particular time. Professor Gita Kenny really has, has documented this, one of her most interesting papers, which I really have read repeatedly, called Perception of Japan in India, Past and Present. And she talks quite a bit over there about the Bengal connection between Japan and, and India. And what emerges from her account is that Bengal and you know, the sons and daughters of Bengal had a very significant role to play in India-Japan relations, but it's by coincident or coincidence or, you know, uh, um, because of, of, of uh, a, a, a policy in the first half of the last century. Those early decades of the 20th century saw Indian nationalist leaders like Rashtihari Bose and Netaji uh, Subhash Chandra Bose draw the Japanese into our Indian independence struggle. 
when I was there in Japan, I was very surprised that a lot of Japanese who actually believed that despite the Burma campaign being a disaster, it was a campaign that got India independence because it hastened the withdrawal of Britain from India. So this is actually a fairly firmly held belief. I'm emphasizing these facets of India-Japan historical ties because there are many who believe that the current phase of our closeness is a consequence of, of a global realignment, which saw uh, the US and its allies, including Japan, reassessing ties with India as it opened its economy. Uh, and it's, suddenly they started appreciating our sort of unbroken record of democracy. You know, earlier I think they saw the whole world through the prism of the Cold War and we were not on their side, we were not against them, but whoever was not with them, they decided were against them. Actually, India and Japan, based on the contacts already, uh, there was, uh, you know, there was, they, they already had these contacts and there was a surge of goodwill uh, for another Bengali, and that was Judge Radha Binod Pal. And uh, uh, Judge Radha Binod Pal is known to every Japanese child because they read about him in their schools. As you know, he gave this famous dissenting judgment at the International Military Tribunal uh, for the East, uh, for the Far East. And, uh, you know, he, he was the one who actually, I think, gave them back a sense of self-esteem at a time when it was very, very low. They lost the war. And, you know, he questioned, I mean, on very legal grounds, the fact of that there seemed to be that the allies were ganging up against Japan. So, you know, he is another person who, who I, one of just, I will just tell you something, a small aside, the, uh, the Indian embassy in Tokyo has one of the best properties, a prime property in Tokyo. And the reason was that this was given to the, by the Japanese to us in a way of saying thank you for that judgment of, of Judge uh, Radha And I hope more people who don't know this, this is a beautiful story of our relationship. So, you know, in the period just after World War II, the relationship was very high on symbolism and special gestures between our two countries. Prime Minister Nehru was giving elephants to the zoo in, in Tokyo because all the animals had died in the war. And I have so many Japanese again who would come and say to me, oh, you know, when we were young, uh, India brought a smile to the faces of our children because we presented them an elephant. You know, they're in a way, very sentimental people. So I think it's all adds to this the perception that they had of us. And I think this also helped at the time that our political relationship had become more mature. Uh, thus, in 1947, Prime Minister Nehru welcomed Japan to the Asian Relations Conference, despite it still being under occupation of the Allied powers. In 1951, this was very significant for the Japanese because there was a San Francisco Peace Conference where they were, you know, there was talk of declaration and they had to pay back a lot of countries we believe that suffered during the, world, the Second World War. But India decided not to attend because they thought Japan was another Asian brother. And uh, we then uh, signed this, a separate peace uh, treaty establishing relations in 1952, and we're soon going to be uh, celebrating 70 years of, the, uh, of, uh, of that anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations with Japan. This was a time also that we had a lot of visits. So Prime Minister Nehru came to Japan, and then Prime Minister Nobusuke she came to India. Now, he's an interesting person because he was a grandfather of Abe. So if Abe had a special feeling for India, he often said, it is because I heard stories of India on the knee of my grandfather. So, you know, this, I think we in Asia, we have these connections, we as Asians and the Japanese are no different. And then, of course, we had, um, you know, Prime Minister Rajendra Prasad had gone and uh, the uh, recent emperor who stepped down, he also came as the crown prince. But what was interesting at this point of time was that this is when we started uh, accepting Yen loans from Japan. And we were the first country to do so because the rest of the Asian countries did not want to. They had very clear memories of the war and they did not want to accept Yen loans. We did. And then this became really a sort of ballast in the relationship. Over time, when things were not so exciting and things were kind of plateaued, the relationship had plateaued. This development cooperation assistance we, uh, that we got really was very, very important in our own development. And then happened in, in, in 2000, the famous uh, reset in our relations. I must say between 1960 and 2000, about four decades were kind of lost decades, not too much happened in the relationship. And this also has some connection with the Cold War, uh, you know, and which had divided the world into two, two halves. The reset in the in India-Japan relationship happened in 2000, following the most difficult phase in our relationship with India tested. 
because the Japanese felt particularly betrayed. They said they had only been the only victims in the world of nuclear nuclear weapons, and the very very the reaction was extremely extremely harsh. But thereafter, I think you know they came on board, and uh, in two thousand, this qualitative change happened under the leadership of Japanese Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori. And Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori, he personally believed. That there were bilateral congruences of interest, and that the turn in the st strategic space around Japan and India, that actually was the rise of China, it was made it a very compelling reason for uh, India and Japan as two democracies to work together. I used to meet him often when I was in Japan, and he used to tell me, you know, when I was going to India, the entire Daimo show, the Foreign Office was against me. They didn't want me to go, and now see, I believe in India, and look where the relationship is. And he was the one who went and launched what was called the Indo India Japan Global Partnership in the 21st century. Um, and um, you know, we reacted with the same enthusiasm. I think India was ready for that. We have also opened up our economy. And Prime Minister Vajpayee then reciprocated with the visit the following year uh, for the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. These visits in quick succession prepared the ground for an examination of the potential of the bilateral relationship and convergences at the regional and the global levels. Uh, there is no doubt that India's growing economic heft, the lore of its market, the second largest after, uh, after China, a growing closeness to Japan's alliance partner, the United States, with whom it often synchronizes its foreign policy and positions on global issues, were also considerations. For India, Japan's financial and technological strengths and our experience of the benefits of Japanese ODA were uh, considerations along with our own reading of the rapid changes in the security environment and the strategic environment, not only in Asia, but uh, immediately in our own neighborhood, as you know. Other drivers of the logic of the stronger relationship were the absence of any baggage of history or territorial disputes between our two countries, which weighed down Japan's uh, relations with China, with Korea, with Russia, and to an extent also with the ASEAN countries to begin with, the, 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 the memories of the war. Um, our mutual commitment to democracy and its attendant uh, institutions was also, I think, uh, a binding factor. They often said that, you know, we are the oldest democracy in, the, in Asia and you are the largest democracy. And so there are reasons for us to work together. Um, what has happened, uh, another important feature of the partnership in, in the past two decades is something I mentioned before, that is popular good, goodwill. You know, when you go and you see, they like Indians. When you meet as Indians, they're happy. They, you know, it's, it's always with a smile, unlike very often when you go to Europe or somewhere where you find so much more racist reaction to people who are not like them. Japanese actually... Um, and this, this was um, very much in display also in, in political support, because when the relationship matured, there has been complete bipartisan support in both countries across all political formations and parties. Therefore, you know, you, it was Prime Minister Abe, uh, Prime Minister Mori, Prime Minister Koizumi, Prime Minister Abe, who set this relationship going to form a party and a coalition led by the LDP. And when they were out of power and the DPJ came in, Nothing happened to the relationship. The relationship continued as it was before. Similarly to in India, because as I said, it was Prime Minister Vajpayee who had gone uh, to begin with and in this new phase of our relationship. And then the NDA was out of power and the UPA came in and is back to being the NDA. But the changes in government have not at all affected uh, the different political dispensations um, or, or this kind of seamless continuum that there is the development and the deepening of our relationship. So this has been a very important, uh, you know, this has been a very important factor that, they, that, that there is um, acceptance at the political and the popular level for a deepening of the relationship, and this makes it very special. The uh, the realization of uh, of political congruences um, and uh, has also affected Japan in another way. It is, you know, generally known to be part of the Western group and all multilateral institutions. But, uh, and, and India on the other side has been the leader of the G77 and NAM, you know, but we've come together to recognize the changing global landscape and there is a benefit of us working together. Even in the past, if there was uh, ideological differences on and global issues, global issues such as counter-terrorism, both of us have suffered it, cyber security, now more recently and in the past also climate change. So 
an interesting aspect of the of the change perception of each other and realization of mutuality of interest is that these um, these these perceptions are not only you know normally it's it's the foreign policy security policy is driven by centers but in japan and india relationship this is percolated down not only to the popular level but to the state level so as a result of which when um, you know when i was in japan we i had a continuous i mean it was like one after the other chief ministers of the states of india all visiting japan and you know they would come there and uh, because also you had uh, japanese development cooperation programs almost in every state of india i keep telling jaika the jaika head that you have a foot in every state of india so that also brought you know that the chief ministers there and this then uh, formed kind of linkages they brought uh, into partnership agreements between states of india and the prefectures of japan and this was a great success uh, you all perhaps knew when prime minister modi went in 2014 i was ambassador there and he signed this agreement which was uh, between kyoto and varanasi uh, you know that there would be cooperation to all cities you know very important for our, our cultural moorings and so that was signed uh, between the two in fact uh, prime minister as chief minister of gujarat had visited japan twice and so uh, when he became prime minister i recall being there and being told uh, but uh, you know the prime minister has said that his first visit to a country outside south asia is going to be japan and he had a very very high regard for japan and that i think is reflected everywhere but recently as you know that uh, uh, prime minister abe was awarded the padmi bhushan at this recent uh, you know uh, republic day um, uh, announcements so this has been a relationship that has continued i think prime minister modi has a special feeling for japan which predates the time when he was prime minister uh, the great changes with indian states uh, has led to these, uh, these these connections and um, i i found that you know it was a very good way to kind of make the center doesn't have time really uh, to look at uh, relationships beyond a certain level and i do have in my mind i, I push for some so there was andhra pradesh with koyama maharashtra vakayama you wouldn't much know the prefectures but you know these where you found commonality between them and i wish we could do this on a larger basis because i think that in doing so and if we find complementarities between our states and prefectures we would have a much stronger relationship that just goes beyond the center to the people and i think this is really required for our our giving the state of our relations with japan i move now to another dimension of our special relationship which is the economic convergences which is what we hear of more economic uh, engagement has been a key dynamic of our relationship some of this predates 2000 uh, i mentioned oda the other thing is suzuki motors so suzuki motors came into india in 1984 and they brought a change i think all of us have lived that change a lot of us uh, have lived that change by manufacturing family sized cars so a lot of us could afford these cars and they also contributed besides um just the cars in in the process they contributed in terms of technology in terms of manufacturing processes in terms of management processes in terms of skills so you know and it it, it transformed india and the india automotive industry to really become a global hub today in india we manufacture cars mm -hmm. and we export to the world and a lot of that is mm -hmm. Excuse me, there is some disturbance. I think, yeah. Is it okay? Excuse me. I think there's some noise. Sure, ma'am. Yeah, I think everybody is muted. Then it's better. Thank you. Right. So, um, any any discussion on mm -hmm. India-Japan economic cooperation needs mm -hmm. a reiteration of the self-evident mm -hmm. complementarities between our two economies. Some, and you know, I think these are things. I mean, why uh, that? What is the strength of the economic engagement? And um, these are demography, because you look at uh, Japan's mm -hmm. aging population mm -hmm. and India's youthful democracy. It is part of something. uh we have an abundance of human capital this is an engendered focus on skill enhancement of young indians both for the indian market as well as employment opportunities in japan 
I think scaling has become a very, very important part of our dialogue and our cooperation. But this is where we can help each other. Young Indians can go and work in Japan and they're facilitating that. We can also skill our people to be better in, in India and work in India, be more employable in India. Uh, the other uh, point of convergence is India's large and growing market. Now, this, I think, is a great pull factor that all Indians must remember. And demands of rapid urbanization, which provides opportunities for Japanese investment, export of goods and services, and also export of projects. And, um, you know, this is one area where we find uh, that uh, there, is a, there are a lot in increasing number of Japanese companies which are now coming to India. The other is India as a capital deficit, but a resource rich industrializing country with competitive labor costs. And this is a perfect destination for Japanese companies. Um, this is more so during this COVID, during the COVID pandemic, when Japan decided that it was too, there was, a, there was an, uh, you know, uh, uh, undue reliance and over dependence, one may say, uh, on China for production. And which actually uh, was disturbed because of the pandemic. And they realized that there was a need to de risk. And the way to do this was to diversify and find other countries where they could produce and diversification of supply chains. And in doing so, they identified ASEAN and India. So I think, given the close relationship between the two countries, what we will see if we play our cards correctly, and I have to say that, is that we are going to see this relationship between the two of us, the economic relationship, strengthen further. And India could one day become a hub for Japanese manufacture, which is targeting markets in Africa, ASEAN, Europe, and beyond. Um, the other convergences, I think, are um, to do with IT, because I think everyone talks about the digital world today. So India strengthens IT software and Japan's excellence in hardware. They, this is a very good uh, combination. Um, and there is also, um, you know, India, the most recent, uh, I think, last couple of years, what has happened is that India has become home to the third largest number of startups. And this has really been a, a great uh, area of attraction for Japanese companies. Uh, so the Japanese came forward and offered to set up a Japan-India startup hub in Bangalore to exchange business collaboration and investments between startups in India. And what I was reading recently was that as per some estimates, already in just a few years, uh, Japanese venture capital companies have invested already about $15 billion in Indian startups. So, you know, it is a dynamic process. We add new areas as we go along. This has no doubt been, um, there has no doubt been progress in economic relationship with Japan now being the fifth largest investor in India. The cumulative FDI of about 35 billion since the year 2000, 35 billion dollars. And um, there are, of course, everything isn't very, you know, rosy. Uh, so what has happened is we signed the CEPA, that was a comprehensive economic partnership agreement between the two countries in 2011. And we thought that, you know, trade would skyrocket and, you know, this would be a turning point. However, that did not happen. And that requires a whole uh, talk by itself. But, you know, trade really has disappointed. And uh, we also, there is, I mean, you know, we perhaps it's too early in the day, but when we compare with Japan's economic relationship and dependence on China, we still feel that, you know, maybe we can do better and that both sides should do better. Because I, I spoke about 1,400 Japanese companies in India. In the, you know, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, and that compares with 30, over 30,000 Japanese companies in China. So I think we have a long way to go. Uh, ASEAN also does, I think, much better than us. An area of economic cooperation, which has been an important pillar of bilateral relationship, has been ODA, which I mentioned. Now, you know, JICA has become, uh, is, not, is, is a foremost uh, donor to India. And this morning, I was in another uh, in another conference. And this was really about JICA's involvement in the Northeast. They are really transforming the Northeast with the infrastructure, uh, you know, in ports, in waterways, railways, bridges, 
you, uh, you be, and not only that, connecting the Northeast to, um, to Bangladesh, uh, through Myanmar, to ASEAN. And, you know, that this is very much part of what India's peace policy is. And why we have Japan there in, in the Northeast is really because I think there's a trust factor. You know, it is a country we trust in the Northeast, which, as all of you know, is very politically sensitive. So um, Japan has been very involved in the infrastructure development and industrial development of India, which is what we actually need. So it has 12 industrial parks, dedicated industrial parks, with most of the companies are Japanese. And we make give them the uh, kind of a Japanese ecosystem where they can work well. Uh, and there also, uh, there's a 13th one coming up in Guwahati, I must mention. And then there are these dedicated uh, 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 you know, infrastructure corridors. One is Delhi, Mumbai. There's one which is uh, Chennai, Bangalore. And this is, uh, there are freight corridors, there are railway lines, um, there are industrial parks along it. So they're really working very closely with whatever our objectives are both in terms of building uh, industry as well as uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, everybody knows of the famous metros. Uh, you know, Delhi Metro is a flagship project, and now we have Mumbai, Mumbai Ahmedabad, uh, the high-speed rail, which will really be iconic when, when it comes. Uh, so we are really looking at um, you know, a, a, a growing convergence uh, in, in the economic relationship, and I think this could only be to our mutual benefit. As I said, we need the technology, we need the financial investments, and they need the markets. And I think we really make a very, very good fit in that in that way. Um, there is also a, a, a great interest in both countries to cooperate and play a role in the geoeconomics of the Indo-Pacific to gain strategic space. And um, this is um, this is perhaps also why they talk about the development of the Bay of Bengal. And I mentioned this because this affects Bengal, where they talk about Bay of Bengal uh, development zone, uh, which would help connectivity with ASEAN. What sets Japan apart from other traditional donors, uh, besides, besides the trust, is that they work in areas of our priorities. They don't come here telling us that these are the environment standards we should have, these are the human rights issues. They come and work with us in areas which are of priority to India, whether it's geographically or, or in terms of what our national um, our priorities are. Thus, we have, Japan is the only country with which we have something called an East Asia Forum. That is Japan, the, the Japanese ambassador and the uh, foreign secretary together, they meet periodically to uh, talk about the development of the northeast of India. From here, I come to strategic convergence. I'm trying to cover a lot of areas and I'm trying to keep your interest. So I, I hope I, you know, it isn't getting too long and boring for you all. Um, I have so far tried to provide some perspective on the historical, political and economic drivers of the Indo-Japan relationship which as you can see is very multi-dimensional, mutually advantageous and is dynamic. It, it's, it's changing, it's, it's always evolving. The fast evolution of this uh, relationship and especially the growing strategic convergence between the two countries has caught global attention. Uh, and this has a bilateral, regional and global dimension. Bilaterally, strategic convergence has been manifest in the growing defense and security relationship between our two countries. The agreement on cooperation on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. You know, this was a, this was really a very very big achievement that we were able to do because of the fact that we were not an NPT country and Japan had great reservations on it, but yet we were able to go uh, go ahead and sign this agreement. Then we have MOU's um, memorandum of understanding on space research. Uh, Japan has supported um, India's full accession to all the international arms control. Uh, regimes, and most significant of all, we recently signed something called AXA, which is Acquisition Cross Servicing Arrangement is what it is called. And basically, it's a military logistics agreement, which we also have similar agreements with Australia and the US. And this will help upgrade strategic collaboration. We can use each other's facilities in ports, you know, while, while our, our navies are on the seas. Um, as I said, India has got these agreements with other port partners. Uh, but what is re remarkable about our defense cooperation was that it was almost negligible uh, until in, in about um, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, in, until 2006, in fact, um, at, at, that was the first time that we had uh, 
a, a visit by our, our, our then uh, Raksha Mantri, um, again, a son of Bengal, um, uh, Honorable Pranam Mukherjee ji. He went there and he's really kickstarted this relationship in the defense area between the two countries. But from that, from almost nothing, relations today have progressed to a level that we have joint exercises between every arm of our military. Naval exercises, army exercise together, the Air Force exercises together, the Coast Guards exercise together. And, you know, this is really something which is uh, we have with very few other countries. Uh, in, and I, I spoke about how the defense ministers meet regularly along with the foreign ministers. But there have also been a lot of agreements. Uh, there has been an agreement on the transfer of defense equipment and technology. And Japan, because of various of, of its history of the Second World War, really did not have these kind of agreements with any country. And we were perhaps the second country after the U.S. with, which they with whom they entered into such an agreement. And now we are going into a further area. We're going to an area of joint research. So we are doing joint research in defense technologies such as unmanned ground vehicles, robotics. So we're going to a completely different plane of cooperation in the security area. As the military and security ties evolved, both countries were clear that the women would not be limited to the bilateral. Uh, but we started drawing up a blueprint of how we could cooperate beyond the bilateral at the regional level and maybe also at the global level. Uh, so there was a great amount of exchanges, policy coordination on security issues, uh, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Indo um, there is a Congress of positions on global threats. You know, and you can understand, read between the lines what the major global, uh, the regional and global threats are, leading uh, primarily, of course, um, it, is it is China, and uh, their projection of economic power uh, through... Uh, uh, through uh, their policies such as the BRI, and also dangers um, that, uh, you know, uh, which uh, we face. I mean, Japan faces, of course, uh, new, uh, North Korea, which has got both nuclear weapons and missile capability. We know our own uh, our security concerns in our area. So we have decided that we, we can collaborate as far as possible, both in traditional and non-traditional threats to our, our security. And also, uh, since the whole world today is so dependent on navigation for our commerce, and, you know, and for our energy security, for our food security, in the case of very many countries, so the freedom of navigation and trade in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is very key to the energy and in, uh, is very key to the economic security of both countries. India and Japan also have a convergence of views in the context of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, with Prime Minister Modi calling the India-Japan relationship a cornerstone of India's Act East policy. The two countries have sought to align themselves, uh, their, their initiatives uh, in the area, you know, and there are certain things, the centrality of the ASEAN, uh, you know, there are certain principles on which both of us have said that we should work together. And this also is, includes uh, issues uh, or, or principles such as uh, the importance of a rule-based order that respects uh, sovereignty, that respects territorial integrity of the countries, that ensures freedom, as I mentioned, freedom of navigation, unimpeded commerce, respect for international law, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. So we are setting up these, we have, in fact, both of us ascribe to these principles, and we're trying to make sure that the whole Indo-Pacific, at least countries who are our partners, also realize the value of these principles, which really comes from the fact of us being two democracies. The target is very clear. Uh, the objective is to enhance maritime security, cooperation in the region, improve connectivity, and ensure prosperity in the wider Indo-Pacific by working together. Other manifestations of strategic convergence has been the instituting of trilateral dialogues with other like-minded countries. So you have Japan, Australia, and India in a trilateral dialogue. You have Japan, US, India in a trilateral dialogue. And uh, we even have this with Indonesia. So this has been, this is a new kind of for, uh, forum where we've been talking to other like-minded countries and bringing, uh, bringing them together. And then of course, there is the Quad. Uh, which I mentioned earlier, which involves, uh, besides us, US and Australia, and where uh, the focus to 
quite a degree is actually uh, strategic and security issues. Uh, starting off tentatively at the official level in 2017, the board has graduated to foreign minister level interactions. Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar was there in uh, Japan in October. And since then, October last year, despite the pandemic, he made a visit there for the board foreign ministers uh, meeting. And recently, they again had uh, a meeting that was, that was virtual. This underscores the common objectives of the participating countries in the region for advancing peace and prosperity uh, within an open, transparent, rule-based order. Another dimension of strategic cooperation, still quite in the nascent stage, um, is both of us trying to work in third countries on projects. I think Japan and India have reached that stage of, mat of maturity where we can undertake economic projects in third countries. And we have made a beginning by, uh, I think we have signed on to projects in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and we are also looking at some projects in Africa. Now, I just do hope this has been not too long and I've been able to hold your attention, but I'm going to leave some time for questions. I would love to hear your questions. And in concluding, I would just like to sum up and say that the Indo-Japan Japan relationship is really a special one. And it's because it has the potential not only for mutual benefit, but it is, can also be a force for change in the Indo-Pacific and in the larger global context. Uh, where, you know, we can, uh, where as democracies, we can work together on the basis of international law. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much again, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, for this opportunity to be able to talk to you. Thank you, madam. Your hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear hello. you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, madam. Your lecture was uh, enriched and enlightened our knowledge and thoughts. So we request our participants to put their questions in the chat box. And uh, shall we read out the questions for you? Yes, now I think that would be nice. Yeah, if that may be easier okay. to do. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So we will. Okay. The first one is from. Uh, okay. Orpit. Where is it? Orpita. Orpita Chatterjee. She says Rabindranath has created this opportunity for Vishwabharati and other universities today to hold open international cultural and educational exchange programs by connecting various nation, nations through literature and culture. In that context, how is India doing today in these exchange programs with Japan? How is India doing in its educational exchange, cultural exchange programs with Japan? Thank you. That's that's really uh, uh, that that's really a very uh, good question. So I will start since you know yeah, you all belong to university to start with student exchanges. So what is happening is that there are a large number of not very very large number. I cannot remember the the figures, but must be about a thousand or so Indian students who are studying in Japan. But I want to tell you there is a problem in this that you know. It is less than the number of Bangladeshi students or even Nepali students who study in, in Japan. And the reason really lies here, not so much in Japan or in the Indian government, but that normally Indians seek English speaking countries. And so they look westwards, either they go to the US, UK, uh, or they look uh, eastwards and they look at Australia or you know even Singapore. So this is one of the reasons and one would really encourage young people in universities to look at Japan they have world-class universities. They're increasingly having courses which are in in, um, in English. Uh, we have a lot of MOUs between universities on both sides, but it is not working as much as one should make it work. But I think that is very important. Um, in so far as cultural exchanges are concerned, I think we can be quite happy with what is happening. You know, we have the Japan Foundation that works in India, and um, you know, they bring a lot of programs. 
uh, to uh, of different aspects and involve Indians also to discover the linkages between our two countries. And in uh, Japan, we have the Vivekananda Cultural Center, which was inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi when I was there in 2014 as ambassador. It is, it is located in the embassy and it does a great amount of outreach and which means also exchanges, exchanges of, you know, various kinds of arts, artists, and so on between the two countries. So that is a fairly good exchange as compared to the education exchange. But in the education exchange, I must say, this I was only talking about students, Japan has been very involved really in a way of um, upgrading and, and uh, you know, technology related courses in, uh, in India. They have uh, started in collaboration with us and IIT in Hyderabad. And they have started several courses around, where, which is more uh, looking at management and technology rather than anything else. I hope I answered your question, Arpita. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, madam. The next question is from Arpita Paul. She says, we have witnessed the heights that Indian economy rose to under the, vision leader, under the visionary leadership of PM Abe and strong partnership of Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi. Can we expect the in that India still remains the preferable center of human resources of Japan under the leadership of Prime Minister Yosh Yoshihide Suga? If yes, which sector or domain specifically calls for the need of Indian, Indian as resources? Right. So, you know, uh, yes, so much is made of this special relationship, and it was a very special re relationship with Prime Minister Abe. But as you know, Prime Minister Suga was his chief cabinet secretary and worked very, very closely with him, and therefore was associated with every policy that he had with India. So when we were analyzing what would happen after, after Prime Minister Abe stepped down and Prime Minister Suga came, we were pretty sure that there would be continuity. Insofar as the economic relationship is, uh, is considered, as I said, there's such complementarities between our two economies. And when they are looking at diversification of supply chains, I mean, which other country would have the various factors which they would require outside China other than India? So we can expect them to come here. In the HR area, and I suppose you're talking about, you know, exchanges in the sense of skilling and taking Indians to Japan, right? So uh, recently, there were a couple of ag agreements which have been signed. One was called the TITP, which was a technical, uh, you know, this is for um, uh, a technical training, technical industrial training program. That was TITP, which was some time ago. And they decided they, they, there was a commitment to take a few thousand people, and apparently a few hundred have already gone. But more recently, very recently, in the last couple of months, there has been yet another agreement, another MOU on human resources. And, you know, they have a shortage of, uh, of people. And so they are wanting people. I mean, you find the Indians, when I was in uh, in Japan, were about 20,000. And this is not very long ago. Now, uh, five years from there, they're 40,000. They have doubled. So I think uh, what they do require is that you have to learn Japanese and perhaps a certain amount of skills before you go. But I do believe that there will be a lot of employment opportunities and that's going to be this exchange, human research exchange, uh, resource exchange is going to be an important area of exchanges between our two countries. Yeah. Thank you, madam. The next question is from Abhijit Banerjee. His, his question is, Asia-Africa Growth Corridor has been seen seen as an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which emerged from the PM Modi Abe friendship in November 20, 2016. The AAGC envisions a sustainable growth strategy through a series of consultations and partnerships across Asia and Africa. Madam, what is your opinion about the future of the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor after the departure of Prime Minister Abe? Thank you, Abhijit, for that question. I want to tell you that the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, if you look at all the documents that are signed at the end of every uh, summit we have, you will never find, uh, you will not find mention of it. Because I think this came out more of out of academia 
and think tanks is something that both people, that both prime ministers actually agreed to. Having said that, because I want to really clarify that, I heard this question very often asked of me. But they did commit to something much more important. They committed to working together on Africa. But they said in working together on Africa, that let it be led by business. So, you know, it should be it should be led by the business sector. And I can tell you, because I have personal information and I know a lot of the big business houses in India, uh, you know, facilitated by the CII and FIKI. So they constantly are now, uh, they have a forum where they're talking about what both of them can do together in Africa. The potential is huge. And yes, that is the whole idea when I was talking about the principles that both of us ascribe to. It is to tell the Africans that you don't have to get into the debt trap. You know, we are going to come with certain principles and, you know, we can work together, Japan and India can work together and give you an alternative, give you a choice. You can take the BRI, you can look at us and you can decide what you want and not just have one option before you. So this is something which will happen. And this will happen, you know, despite uh, Prime Minister Abe not being there now and, you know, uh, the government having changed. I think there is a commitment, there's a very fundamental level in the agreements between the two prime ministers that we are going to work together in third countries. We hear this all the time. But the way it is we're looking at this happening in Africa is that, the, uh, that it's led by industry. And why is it led by industry? I'll also explain. You'll wonder why. Because, you know, the Japanese always have this perception that India already has a large footprint in Africa. You know, our Tatas are there, our companies are there, our diaspora are there. So they always felt that India, India knew Africa better than they did. So they want to work together with us. And I think they see the opportunities of us working together. We do work together in some areas. I think in Angola, we're together in the oil sector. In Kenya, there was some agreement that we would together build a cancer hospital. And that was agreed to in one of the uh, one of uh, summits that they were. So this is a possibility. This is not a possibility. It should happen. But I think there should be a little, uh, little more help from uh, of the industry on both sides should be able to sit together and do this. Is that okay, uh, Abhijit? Yeah. There is no more question. Okay, thank you, madam. <clears throat> it is always a pleasure attending your deliberations. We are enriched and enlightened. Now I request our respected Upacharya, Professor Biddu Chakraborty for his comments, observations, on today's lecture. So please. Sir, I can line. Sir, a video on me. Connect. Connect the video on me. Uh, till, till, till Upacharya joined us, joins us, uh, Madam, uh, your lecture, it reminds me of the four-line verse composed by Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore way back in 1905. He writes, Geruva Bashpuri Dharma Guru, Tomar Deshe, Tomar Wearing saffron robes, the masters of religion, dharma, went to your country to teach. Today, we come to your door as disciples to learn the teachings of action, that is karma. I hope we could, so, so uh, this, yeah, this is uh, way but back in 1905. That's right. But he could see yes, the future almost, you know, that he could, uh, at that time, the relationship was, you know, just beginning. So he really had the sense. He's remembered very much in, in Japan, you know, in every place yeah, he went into. Yeah. That's good. And, and definitely we will see to it that some of our students carry uh, out the research on Kobo Daishi. It really yes, for... we need to do it. You know, it is. A, I think I mentioned it to you uh, when I when I was there because it's been a. The more I learned about him, how he learned Sanskrit, how he he was a he was actually a scholar in Sanskrit, having never visited India. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one more question from Professor. So, uh, Madam, one more question over here. Professor Shomiran Mondol is here. 
बोलो सो ही इज गोइंग टू आस्क अ क्वेश्चन या समीर अंडल प्लीज मैडम एक्सेलेंट लेक्चर actually i have spent my uh, you know the post doctoral research time in japan as a medical college i know very much that country so and uh, one question uh, i have one question madam what about the sports industry development sports industry development uh, in japan and india should i develop should i develop uh, sports industries in japan i i i know that uh, the sports industry is very much developed So is there any relationship or is there any any strategy of indian government to develop sport and another question is another yeah, question is please 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 madam please go ahead please wait yeah. another question is uh, i know that uh, indian martial art actually it is uh, the and japanese martial art there is a historical relations so you are not highlighting anything up in your lecture about this indian a uh, martial art and the japanese martial art relationship so in future i hope uh, you a special lecture on this uh, <laughs> in this area madam it's, it's uh, very interesting yeah you know uh, it suppose i'll start with the indian martial arts so you know we believe that it was bodhi dharma who took the indian martial arts to china now there is a story in japan that bodhi dharma visited there i mean there is no empirical evidence but they believe that he also um, you know that he visited there so there is perhaps a connection but i haven't seen really i mean there are a lot of people who are you know in india who are uh, involved in jujutsu and the connection i know the jujutsu connection with uh, with uh, vishwamitra which anti niketan so that's how you started and you know i don't see it at an institutionalized government to government level i have not seen it <coughs> sorry um in so far as the sports industry is concerned we sometimes get coaches from there you know for different games but nothing really beyond that <coughs> but we can do more on sports i think you know they're doing so well now in even in tennis uh i think we can do with more uh, sports and now with olympics if it happens uh maybe i'll be a beginning for us thank you madam thank you once again for very much for giving your precious time i thank our upacharya with whom we cannot connect at this moment i thank our upacharya for giving his valuable time and presiding over the session i thank dr nimai chat shaha in charge vishwabharati lecture series and his technical team i also thank the participants of today's lecture for their active participation madam once again thank you very much it is always a delight listening to you thank you thank you so much and thanks so, to all uh, madam, the participants i really i, yeah, I could see that they were interested yes please madam let me let, let me allow to take one permission from your side yes. that usually what we do is that uh, this video recording we need to upload in our library youtube channel right if you don't have any problem because you know many people by glitches of technology and by uh, by their routine business they may not be able to listen this uh, marvelous lecture what i actually understood so to to make it accessible audible to all of them we have our channel so if you kindly allow us usually we did it so we very keen we are very keen to upload this precious lecture to our visual library uh, youtube channel so ma'am uh, shall i get your permission absolutely absolutely even as you started asking i it'd be an honor for me i'd be very very happy absolutely uh, please do please thank I you ma'am and we are eager yeah yeah okay okay and we are eagerly we are eagerly waiting for you to receive in our campus physically as told by our honorable vice chancellor i invite you <laughs> uh, i i am happy and i am sure that soon after new normal when will be come and you will contact with our geeta madam and through geeta madam we will receive in our campus to you we wish all the fraternity is eagerly waiting you to receive uh, our Jessica. campus in physical mode because you know virtual is not uh, make too much happy to us unless you will be physically able to reach in the campus and so we are really uh, happy to extend our cordial welcome to you thank, thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you thank, thank you all this thank, thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you. so thank you dear all participants and colleagues let us now conclude the meeting technically thank you very much